Good morning. My name is Sam. I am an alcoholic and I'm also a son of recovery. Let's start out with a serenity prayer. Good and gracious God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. I am reading through Recovery Dharma, how to use Buddhist practices and principles to heal the suffering of addiction. We are learning about community right now, and I'm in this section called Isolation and Connection. Addiction and addictive behaviors can create people without roots. Some of us have been uprooted from our families and from society. We wander around feeling as though we've not qu we're not quite whole because our addictions feed our isolation and loneliness. Many come from broken families and feel rejected by society or have been isolated from society through incarceration or institutionalization. Not all of us have disassociated to that degree, but we do tend to live on the margins, looking for a home, for something to belong to. A community of practice, a sangha, can provide a second chance to someone who's become alienated from society or just a comfortable place to bring all of ourselves, including parts we don't usually share with others. If the community of practice is organized with a friendly, warm atmosphere, we can find support for our practice and recovery. In our addictions, we self-medicated or engaged in behaviors that helped us deal with the pain of separation. The relief was temporary, of course, often leaving us lonely and isolated than before, yet we returned to it again and again. For many of us, it was the only way we knew to relieve the pain. Even in sobriety, when faced with well-meaning but insistent people telling us how to overcome our addictions, the instinct for many of us is to keep to ourselves. It's a habitual way of being in the world that a lot of us share. It wasn't it wasn't just getting high, though for a lot of people in his fellowship in this fellowship and outside it, that was the main road we took to escape. There were other traps that snagged us even if we were never even if we never struggled with substances, sex, food, self harm, social media. We may have tried to keep help with those compulsions, but often found others minimizing or trivializing them, especially in comparison to drug or alcohol abuse. For those of us whose primary addictions are around behaviors and processes, we may have felt alienated and excluded from recovery itself. Many of us found ourselves like, like raw, exposed nerves when we stopped using those ways to escape. And sometimes the last place we wanted to be was in a room with strangers in a circle of chairs all facing each other, talking about how we can't drink or use or, or, use or participate in our destructive behaviors anymore. The paradox is that it's in that kind of space where we're accepted as we are and that we can begin to let go of our reflex to hide. That is the truth. I know that was the truth for me when I walked into my recovery house, um, which is 12 step based. But um, I know that that I found that there uh, from the very first meeting. I found um, a group of people who completely understood me, even though none of them had ever met me, and it was a warm and comfortable space where I could finally just kind of, like, be. Um, I know that's not the way for many people, but that was the way it was for me. Continuing on. Many of us lost the ability, if we ever had it, to form relationships without the social lubricant of alcohol or drugs. Sometimes that was because we dealt with rejection, trauma, or loss at an early age and became anxious and avoidant around others. Or maybe we just felt different than everyone else since the day we were born or came from a small community or a big family and got sick of people nosing into our business. Whatever reasons we had to isolate, we got to a point where it stopped serving us. The substances and behaviors we used to protect ourselves began to harm ourselves and others. We drove people away to be safe, and as a result, we became even more lonely. Some of us learned to isolate for good reason. People we loved and trusted harmed us in terrible ways, some of us lived in communities and families where we constantly felt unsafe, where trusting anybody too much could be costly. In recovery, we're making the scary, difficult, and brave decision to try it out again. All humans are driven from birth to seek close all humans are driven from birth to seek close human contact. Though when we're deprived of it and even begin to lose the ability to find it, we suffer and become vulnerable to craving and addictive behavior. The mindfulness techniques and insights that the Buddha taught are, to key, are key to recovering this ability. But it's not something we have to do alone. In fact, having people to help and support us on the path is an integral part of the teachings. 
So, as it turns out, the solution and the way to get to, to the solution are actually one and the same. A lot of us are perennial outsiders. We felt often with some justification that we've that we have that we have been failed and abandoned by schools, by religious institutions or government, and often by our own families. As a result, we came to mistrust organizations and groups and even the idea of belonging itself. The double blind there, of course, is that because we never allow anyone to get to know us, we cut off the possibility of ever belonging. The Buddha taught that nothing and nobody exists on its own. He said, since this exists, that exists. And since this does not exist, that does not exist. We're connected to other people through the way we interact, through the air we share, through our existence together in nature. Trying to ignore or resist this interconnection is basically trying to destroy something which already exists. This does not mean that we're literally dependent on others for our life and our existence, but that the life and existence of everybody and everything develops through their relationships with things outside themselves, the food they ate, the environment they live in, the history, and the circumstances of their world. It's a great web of being that each of us is connected to without any effort of our own, and being aware of that connection gives us space to have meaningful and positive relationships with others. It is a choice that each of us has to decide what we want to do with the reality of our connection. Sangha, in a very broad sense, means being willing to let other people in, to let them matter. To do that, we have to be willing for other people to let us in. When we can even consider the possibility of that happening, there's the potential for us to move forward, move toward liberation and the benefits are felt almost immediately. All of us, during our development and experience of life, had experiences that make us doubt our own voice, or the value or wisdom of expressing that voice. Many of these doubts contributed to the suffering we experienced during addiction and continue to make it difficult to connect to our own recovery. Our meetings are intended as places where we can feel safe and comfortable authentically expressing what we really feel and experience. However, many of us, because of prior experience and experiences in both social settings and in the recovery community, struggle with this a lot. We often struggle just to understand our feelings and experiences. The Sangha allows us to start to explore the ways we can find and authentically express our voices, to value our own voices, and to be sure that our voices are heard. Your recovery sangha can be one that focuses on helping and encouraging those those many voices. In the Buddhist tradition, it's not just it's not just that we don't have to do this work alone. It's that we need the support of others on the path to waking up. That is not just in the Buddhist tradition. That is also in the in the twelve step tradition. And you could say that here in the twelve in the twelve step tradition. It's not just that we don't have to do this work alone. It's that we need the support of others on the path to waking up. And in fact, I think in every recovery program, that's the truth. In a famous story, the Buddha's cousin and assistant Ananda came to visit him and remarked. This is half of the whole way of the holy life, having admirable people as friends, companions, and colleagues. The Buddha disagreed, saying that having admirable people as friends, companions, and colleagues is actually the whole of the holy life. When we come together to talk honestly about ourselves and what happened in our lives, something very powerful can happen. When we see people committing to be who they truly are, in all their imperfections and their longing to be free, our hearts naturally begin to open because their realness allows us to be more real. In their vulnerability, our wise, admirable, admirable friends give us the freedom to be vulnerable ourselves and to speak our own truths. So, our Sangha becomes a place where we are supported and encouraged to stay on the path, even when it's challenging or our progress seems stuck. Our friends, our wise friends, are without words telling us that if we keep going, so will they. And often, that makes all the difference. So isolation and connection. I mean, I talk about community a lot uh, because community is important, and not and being connected is utterly important in our just in our lives in general. And that is what this is talking about. How. A lot of us, in addition, have stepped away from being in connection with actual connection with others, in honesty and vulnerability and truth connected with others. Um, 
So uh, breaking out of that can be really difficult, as this is talked about. Um, but being in community is the uttermost important thing in our recovery. Um, being welcomed by others and welcoming others as well. It can be very difficult. Um, and there was something in here that said, talked about building relationships as long as... Um, And some of us may have not been good at that before. Um, I mean, there's a lot that could have driven us away. And I know that for me, I felt different a lot growing up. I felt really different growing up. And that really had to do a lot with my own sexuality. Um, but I always felt very different growing up from everybody. Um, and it felt weird and strange. And it was hard. Um, but, you know... I came to find out that there are a lot of other people who felt that way. So, um, next we're going to go on to working with others, which is also a big important part of um, 12 step journeys. So, with that, today's prayer life is a celebration. Lord, help me today to mend a quarrel, seek out a forgotten friend. Dismiss suspicion and replace it with trust. Write a friendly letter. Give a soft answer. Encourage another. Manifest my loyalty in word and deed. Keep a promise. Find the time. Forgive an enemy. Acknowledge any wrongdoing. Try to understand. Examine my demands on others. Think of someone else first. Be kind. Be gentle. Laugh a little. Be happy. Show my gratitude. Speak your love. And speak it again. Life is a celebration. So I hope you know that life is a celebration. And as you go out, please leave any comments, questions, or thoughts for me. And I hope you have a blessed day.